and and I, I love I love that you know uh, that you're thinking about the rural area because a lot of times we don't think about the rural areas when we start thinking about transportation. Uh, one, I, I stay in the suburbs of Atlanta. I stay right on the cusp of rural to you know city, right? I stay around that cusp. And one of the things that I see a lot of times is what I like to call the sidewalk to nowhere. It's, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's this uh, master plan that they have where they, when, when they build a, a new building in that area, they have to build, and, and you, you've probably seen this too, John, where they have to build that piece of sidewalk and that the sidewalk is like right there in the front of the Dollar General and it starts at the Dollar General and ends when you leave the parking lot. And I'm right. like, how far is this part? How far is this sidewalk supposed to take me? Right, <laughs> it's only in front of the store. That's it, right? And I never understood that, right? So uh, I, I bring up that because now we now we like to get into public policy. <laughs> what changes in public policy do you foresee that we need to tackle first, or what do you think is one of the most important public policies we need to change? Yeah, so I will say the blessing for rural areas, I'll start there. They have a blank slate. Like mm -hmm. they haven't made the same mistakes of the cities that have really sprawled and been so heavy on interstate, which should have never, we all this, we all know this, it should have never been going through communities in the first place. And so the rural areas have that blank slate to really design smartly, right? Like smart cities, smart towns. Um, but as far as policy, we, first things first is public good. Like there is a complete erosion, particularly in places like Louisiana where private is just like, it, it, whatever they say goes. And so we've got to get to a point where private companies and contractors, especially ones that are not like union and giving good paying jobs to Louisianans, that, making sure that the voice of, of the people is centered over the profit. And so that, that's the biggest reason why we're here in the first place, because there's a tons of, there's tons of, uh, businesses that stand to benefit from these projects that we really don't need. Um, so that's one thing. And then number two is the willingness to really cut some of those projects from the list. And so whether it's the highway priority program or it's the current uh, long, what do they call it? The statewide transportation improvement program, which is like that 10 year long range plan or the statewide transportation plan, which also, I wish they would have a policy to condense some of these documents because they're too meaty for the average person. I hate going through them and they're hard to understand without getting someone to decode it for you. Um, but just in general, really condensing what's possible, but then also what's allowed. Um, mm -hmm. So at the parish level, we really need to see some city planning and zoning ordinances changed. This anti um, multifamily units, this inability to really build densely so that we are concentrating people, which makes transit even more successful and accessible and ubiquitous, that, that's got to be shifted. Like our culture is very much single family units and, you know, huge yards, but we've got to really get to a place. And then of course, you know, on the back end of those, of, of sprawling is, you know, we're seeing more and more flooding, particularly in the Southern parishes, um, but like anywhere across Louisiana that gets too much rain and too, in such a little time, we're seeing flooding in ways that we haven't historically. And so we need to be aware that climate change is here. We can't build as we used to, as we used to. And then also our ordinances and our policies are outdated with our reality. Um, some of the other harder things, um, reduce lanes and slower speeds, which of course y'all know Chuck Marone preaches about. Because <laughs> yeah, I was reading yeah. the books and Right. So like all of that has to happen. And it, at first it felt very um, like disparate and distinct from one another. But the reality is all these policies that really make sure that a select few of contractors or developers get, you know, large wealth off of hardworking Louisianans also make sure that we're stuck with either flooding areas um, areas that are, you know, divested from because there's always moving to the new spot of the city instead of investing where there's already concentration. And then this anti-transit because they wanted us to be addicted to cars and oil and gas. And so there's just a lot of different things that work right now that, that um, create a landscape that make it very difficult for what we're going for, but we've got to get started. So we've already done that. And we're just trying to figure out, okay, what are the different levers we can pull? What are the different, um, and some of it, the hard part is a lot of it is advocacy in bureaucracy versus an actual bill. 
So it's really just kind of getting legislators and different folks and, and decision makers to understand how all these policies, including racism and redlining, have led to where we are in Louisiana, where we don't have innovative, fresh, and effective systems. So, and you brought up at the end right there, you brought up uh, the racial aspects of it. And, and you know, one of the things that um, I've seen, especially, um, you know, in the South, is there a lot of, there's a lot of misconceptions. And a lot of these misconceptions have been built on these uh, racial policies, um, Jim Crow policies, but also some misconceptions on the class level. All right. Yeah. Now, what are some of the misconceptions that you see that that has uh, became a problem to try to get the message out about public transportation? Yeah. So the big I mean, obviously, every time there's a campaign, the campaign comes from a place of scarcity. And we're trying to get away from that. Louisiana is an abundant place with amazing people, amazing culture. And there's plenty of money. It's just the normal people don't have it. And so how do we get to a place where we're not just redistributing wealth, but like recognizing that while our campaigns, particularly around tran transit have historically been, you need to make sure to vote yes for that system or that black mom's not gonna get to work. Also recognize you person in your car are also not served by this system. Like it doesn't work for you to sit in hours of traffic, wasting your life, inactive, not moving, but also folks in different uh, parts of the country and the world with more ubiquitous transit have healthier and happier and longer lives because they're not being polluted all the time. And they're also walking and getting around. And so all of us are, are not served whenever our transit systems are not at their most robust. And so it's not just about keeping a bare bones transit system for poor people or black people or brown people or rural or whomever. It's also because all of us suffer when our systems in their public in their public form are not maximized and so i think that's the biggest misconception and then of course like we said before of just like people think i have to give up my car right now but it's not that it's more about driving less and having the option not to and right now so many of us are locked into cars and it's a more expensive life particularly in a state that can't afford to fix all their roads and bridges. And so most of us are getting nails in our tires every couple of days, or there's hit and run because insurance is horrible and expensive <laughs> as well. Like it's just a nightmare financially. And a lot of people don't have the opportunity or don't take the time to step back and recognize that a car centric society is a disservice to everybody. And in a lot of ways, the irony is that, um, you know, black people, brown people, poor folks, workers are actually subsidizing the rest of us who benefit from the roads while they take a transit system that doesn't fully serve them. So, and you know, honestly, a lot of the responses are always that transportation, how are we gonna make sure it makes money? Well, for us, it's a public good. So it doesn't need to be about profit. <laughs> we can, we, we don't worry about that with roads and bridges. So let's not worry about that when we're getting people to where they need to go in buses and trains and other forms. Don't, don't you guys think there's a culture here, though, that says riding a bus is for losers? Like, I need to have a huge car, not just a car, but it needs to be a really nice car, a, a coach, a chariot to take me to work. And, and that's hurting us. We, we don't tax ourselves enough to pay for all of the roads we want to build. Why can't we pay for transit and all enjoy it together, it seems would be very fair.